Hello, everybody. Um, here's my second go at actually recording this video. I, I did it once before and it didn't record. I forgot to press record. So, um, <clears throat> this is the lecture for the uh, first chapter in the uh, computer concepts part of the book. It's called Module One Impact of Digital Technology. And I'm going to talk about mostly stuff that isn't in the chapter. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the things that are in the chapter. Um, make sure that you browse the chapter and watch the video because uh, the video stuff will definitely be on the test and there'll be some stuff from the chapter on the test as well. Uh, again, we'll do a review for the test. So I'm trying to share a whiteboard right now. Okay, so here's the whiteboard. And uh, the first thing that we need to talk about is we need to talk about what a computer is. So <clears throat> basically, I'll just put on here computer and a question mark. What is it? Well, uh, it's a bit of a difficult question, but um, what's an easier question is what do we use a computer for? And so basically, we use a computer to perform tasks that we want to perform. And we do this by using software. So applications, even on a smartphone, which is also a computer or a tablet, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, it doesn't matter. The software is what gives the computer its capability. So programs, Programs that we install on our computer let us do things. Now, if you just want to create a, a document, you want to type something up, most of us use a program called Word. It's by Microsoft, and uh, basically it's a word processing program, and it lets us create documents that have text in it. So a word processor is basically a program that lets us work with text. Now, Programs that are installed on all of our computers are what differentiate our computers from one another. Even if we all had the same model, the same computer, uh, after a while, we're going to install stuff, <coughs> programs, I should say, not stuff. We're going to install programs that we need in order to do whatever tasks it is that we need to perform. So those are the things that differentiate two computers, even though the hardware is exactly the same, from one another. Now, <clears throat> what else do we do with computers? Well, we use computers to get online. And basically, that has to do with using the internet. So I'll just put internet here. I have to hold my screen with with my right hand so it doesn't wobble up back and forth when I write on it. So the internet is all about getting information uh, and sharing information with others. So uh, when we do research, we need to look something up. And whether the research is academic research for writing a paper or whether it's for, um, it's warm in here, so I'm gonna turn the fan on. No, I'm not. Uh, whether it's for uh, doing academic research or whether it's just you want to buy a new television and you want to see what the specs are, uh, what's a good television as opposed to what's not so good, uh, and researching the prices, uh, that's also internet stuff. And that's also considered research and it's probably the kind of research we do most often. Uh, what else do we use a computer for? We use a computer to communicate. So again, that's sharing information. For the most part, that's using the internet. So communication is very important, whether it's email or whether it's using Instagram or Snapchat or whether it's um, posting stuff to Facebook <coughs> or any other kind of social media. Um, we are communicating with others and others are communicating with us. So there's a, a kind of a two-way street with the internet. Either we are grabbing information, so we're getting information from others, so they're sharing with us, 
or we're posting something um, and we're sharing information with others. <clears throat> uh, what else do we use it for? Oh, I know. Storage. I don't know what just happened. I should undo. So let me come down here and click undo. I don't know why that big long line just appeared. There we go. Just do an S, storage. Yeah, that's wrong too, because I'm spelling it wrong. There we go. Uh, this is actually a big thing because there are, we have to think about when we think about computers, the digital way of doing things, which is how computers work, and the analog way of doing things. So for instance, uh, <clears throat> if you have, like my father did, uh, you know, 100, 2, 3, 4, 500 pictures that you've taken analogly, in an analog way, where you have prints, you have to store them. And the big difference is, is that uh, when you store those, there's a couple of ways to do prints. For instance, you can get a photo album, and so you put the individual pictures into a, a kind of a book. Um, and the storage takes up physical space in the real world. Now, uh, if you don't have a photo album, you find a shoebox or something, and they tend to fit in there. But still, the more images, the more prints that you have, the more real physical space it takes up. Whereas on a computer or in a digital form, whether it's on a traditional laptop or desktop or whether it's on a phone like this, when we have videos and pictures, <clears throat> the physical space doesn't really increase the more we have. If you have 100 pictures on your phone, it's still the same size as if you have 400 pictures on your phone. Uh, the same holds true for the laptop that I have here or whatever. Um, if you have one Word document, your storage takes up the same amount of space it would as if you had, you know, 300 Word documents. Whereas in the analog form, <clears throat> it's going to take up more space in a real physical sense. So the more of something, like if you have 300 books on, your, on, on a computer, it takes up digital space, which is uh, a storage space on the hard drive, but it doesn't take up any more physical space. Whereas if you have 300 books in real life, you probably have bookshelves that you need to buy and then you have to put or put them in boxes or wherever, but they take up physical space. So you have to actually figure out where to put them. <clears throat> um, so that's what we use a computer for most of the time. Now there's some other things that we can use computers for, but I, I try to stay in the, you know, 80% kind of range. There's always outliers and everything. I tend to talk in generalities. So obviously you could use uh, computers to control robots and on a factory floor and all kinds of other things. Um, but most of us aren't doing that. So um, we won't worry about that. So what is a computer? What, what does it basically do? Well, it's a, here, let me clear this. And then <clears throat> I'll just write computer here again. With a question mark. So what does it do? What is it? Well, there's a couple of ways to define what a computer is. First of all, it's an electronic device. You have to plug it in. But its basic function is very similar, and I told you this in, in a previous video, uh, very similar to a toaster. <laughs> it's basically an input device, input, output device, actually, input, whoops, output. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a sore throat because I did this lecture already once. Um, and so we have to be careful about what it is that we're doing here. So let's talk about input and output and what the error represents. So input basically is when we take something and we make it, we create it, not transferring it. You have to be very careful. When you have a Word document on a flash drive, let's say you've stored it on a flash drive like this, and you plug it into the computer and then you transfer that file onto this computer that is not input. 
That's just transferring information from one place to the next. It's already in its digital form. What we mean by input <clears throat> is the creation. So when you take your phone and you go to camera and you take a picture, now you've created a digital form of the analog world that we live in. So that's input. When you type a Word document, when you type it up, that's input. If I take, for instance, a page from this book, the book, and we live in an analog world, by the way, the book here, let's say that I take this page and I put it on a scanner and I scan it and create a digital file. Well, that's input because it wasn't digital before. If I record some kind of sound or music, what I'm doing right now where I'm uh, using the camera to record a video, that's input because I'm creating from the analog a digital version. Later on, when I move this file and post it on our Canvas web page, that's not input. That's just transferring it from one place to the next. Okay, so that's what input is. Output. What is output? Output is the final, final, well, let me just put it this way. So you create a Word document and you type it all up. And your output then is your final version of that Word document. So, which means that we're doing something in here. And in here, and this is what the computer does and lets us do, is it lets us process the input to create the output. And processing isn't very difficult to understand. <coughs> processing is just doing something to the input. So with a Word document, if I change the font size, I change the color of some text, I center some stuff, I, maybe I underline things, that is processing my input. And when I'm done with my Word document, I, it looks the way it's supposed to. That's the final form, that is my output. And again, typically to do the processing, we have to, do, we have to use some kind of software. So the software that lets us edit whatever it is that we're working with. So let's say that my input, I create a digital picture. It's on my computer and I decide that I want to crop it because there's some parts of it that I don't like. Um, so I use a program, whatever kind of program that I have, the photo editing, whatever it is that I have, and I crop the image. And while I'm there, I say, hey, you know what? It's a little bit dark, so I'm going to brighten it. So you move a little slider over and you brighten it a little bit. And maybe you change the colors a little bit. That's all processing. And then when I like what I have, then I have my output, which, I, which we typically save as a file. And so from my input, I used a program to do stuff to it. And then I created what I liked, which was my output. So let's talk about input and output, uh, how we can input stuff. So let me clear this. Every time I clear that, I go to format. Um, let me clear this and let's just talk about input. So how can I input stuff from uh, its analog form to its digital form? Now, there are only four kinds of uh, information that a computer can work with. And those four types are text, graphics, uh, video, and audio. So how can I input text? Well, I can use a keyboard. I can use a scanner. Um, I guess I could use a microphone because there is software that will translate your voice into uh, text. Um, and actually, I think Word will do it. Uh, there's, I think it's built in. 
All you need is a microphone and you could just talk to it. Uh, it takes a while for it to learn how you say things so that it's, it's good, but um, yeah, I guess a microphone can be used to input text. Uh, so we have a keyboard, obviously you type. A scanner where you can take something that's already typed and uh, it will create a digital image for you. So if you have a handout or the syllabus and you wanna scan it, uh, I can't use that. Um, let's say that I have this book right here and I wanna scan the cover, you know, I just put it on the scanner and it will create a, a file. <coughs> And so now it's, it's, it's input using a scanner. And with a microphone, I just said, you can talk in word, you can just talk and it will, you know, write whatever it is that you're saying. So it, it, it um, converts your voice into text. Okay, so how do we do graphics? Well, I guess with graphics here, I should do, um, we can do use all three of these. So with graphics, I can also use a scanner. I can't use a microphone, but I can scan graphics in. I guess you could create the graphic from scratch by using a uh, drawing pad or your touch screen or your uh, stylus with a uh, touch screen. So <clears throat> we can create that. If you have pictures or you have other things uh, that are printed out, you can just scan them and you will create a digital copy. Obviously, creating a picture, uh, you would use a digital camera. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, I think that covers it. So with video, we need a digital uh, video recording device. So um, we need some kind of uh, like a camera, most cameras will do video. Typically, uh, video has audio with it, so we we have a microphone, but you know, a microphone doesn't do video. It's just part of the process. Um, what else? Oh, you can scan analog movies into, so if you have film, you can use a scanner and it will scan each frame of the movie. Uh, and then put it together and you have a video. So I guess we could use a scanner. I'm gonna put camera here. That's an M, I'm sorry, my device. So graphics is a camera. And we can use a scanner, so I will link to there. And then audio, basically we can just use a microphone. I guess we could, um, we could change text uh, from a keyboard to audio by using a program also. So that's our input. Now, what about output? So let's do output. And again, we have text, graphics, Audio, sorry, and video. Uh, is that an E? It's supposed to be an E. <clears throat> so how do we output text? Well, obviously, the main way to output anything is a display. And I use display instead of monitor because we can use all kinds of things as a monitor. So you can use your television as a monitor. Um, you don't just have to have a, a dedicated computer monitor. Although this laptop has one that's dedicated. My phone has a screen, right? But you could use an overhead projector. Uh, you could use your television, you know, and get big uh, output. So uh, we display it. <clears throat> How else? Oh, I could use a printer to output it. Uh, so again, let me draw arrows to each one of these. Uh, how else could I output this? I guess I could have, and again, I don't wanna be too esoteric. Uh, I don't wanna work in that 5% uh, or 10% of people or even 15%. I guess you could output text by having it read to you using 
well, I guess not using speakers, I was going to say. But basically, we're converting the text to audio and then outputting the audio. So I don't think that that counts. So never mind. So how do we output graphics? Everything can go on a display, except for audio. Uh, I can print graphics. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So with audio, the only way really to get it out is to use speakers. And whether the speakers are the speakers that are in your laptop or their headphones or earbuds, it doesn't matter. Earbuds, by the way, are just like little teeny mini speakers that you put close to your ear. Uh, and so are headphones. So, but you have to have speakers to output it, otherwise you can't hear it. And then video, um, you can't print video, you can't print audio. Um, so I guess the only thing that we really have with video is display, and we've got to split up the audio portion of the video uh, from the, the moving image portion of the video. So really we have to display it somehow to see it. <clears throat> So we have to use a monitor of some type, whether it's a projector or whatever. Um, so those are the four types of input. Those are the four types of output. And those are basically the things that we can use to um, output them uh, and to input them, the devices. So let me clear this again and let me go back to what a computer is. Yeah, so what is a computer? It's an input-output device. It takes input from the user. It uses some sort of software to process that. And not automatically, we typically do the processing. So when you click bold and make something bold, you're processing your input. And then we create our output. Output is typically saved, so we're saving the information as a file. And by the way, that's the definition of a file, is it's some sort of saved information. And that information can be text, audio, video, or graphics, not necessarily in that order. Um, so we process stuff. Uh, the, another way to say this is that a computer can take data, and I don't like this way uh, as much as I like the input-output and information to create information. Oops, I'm running out of room. <clears throat> and again, we're processing in the middle. So basically data can be thought of as individual facts and figures. So if I say to the number 32, for instance, that's a piece of data. It has no context. It has no meaning. I mean, 32 is a quantity of something, but uh, it doesn't have any meaning because it's, it doesn't have any context. So if I say red, you all know what the color red is. But if I just say red or blue or green or orange, it doesn't matter what color I use, you know what it is I'm talking about, but it still doesn't have any context. So it's not considered information. If I say the word desk, you know what a desk is. You might not know exactly what it looks like, but you know the concept of a desk. I'm sitting at one. Um, but that again has no context, so it's, it has no meaning. So that's what, how we define data. Information is defined as being data that's been made meaningful. So if I say there are 32 red desks in the warehouse, now I've combined the data together and I've created information. And again, the information is data that's been made useful, but it doesn't have to be useful to us. It just needs to be useful to someone. It doesn't matter who. Um, then it's considered information. So we might not care that there are 32 red desks in the warehouse, um, but you know the person who's doing inventory control does. <clears throat> now, uh, I don't like this one as much as I like the first one because the data and the information can change. There's kind of a scale. So you could consider a letter to be data and then a word to be information. 
most likely not, but um, you could. And then you could move up. You could say, well, a word is data, but then a sentence is information. And then you could say, well, hell, a, a, a sentence is data and a paragraph is information, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of, there's a kind of a magnifying glass that you can use and zoom in and zoom out. Uh, we could say a paragraph is data and the whole paper, which consists of multiple paragraphs put together is the information. So that's why I don't like this one as much, but just know the basics of data and information. Data has been, is, information is data that's been made useful. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what a computer is used for. And remember that the processing is just doing stuff to what's on the left here, to create what's on the right. And it can be very simple. All you gotta do is make something bold or change the font size and you've already processed it. Uh, you can crop an image, that's processing. Um, okay, so hopefully that's clear. Now, we also need to look at, because computers are digital devices, we need to look at what digital is as opposed to what the other thing is. So the other thing is called analog. So we have analog and digital. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, we are analog creatures. Our world is an analog environment. And basically what that means is that uh, things are represented by uh, themselves. So like this is a cup and it's, this cup is represented by this cup. That doesn't make much sense. Let's take a look at text. So if we look at the, the, the English alphabet, A, B, C. These three letters are represented by these three shapes. And because it's language, uh, each one of these letters has a sound associated with it. How to pronounce it. Now, why is an A shaped like this or like that for a lowercase a? Well, the reason is because somewhere in the past, somebody decided or a group of people decided that this would represent the letter A. Now, they could have come up with something else. So, like, we could do, that's a letter A. Or they could have decided that this was a letter A. Or, hell, they could have said, this is the letter A. Right? And so, you have to remember, even letters are just random characters that are assigned to and that we've given meaning to. Okay, now, when, when we represent a word, for instance, like analog here, let me undo, like the word analog, oops, takes up space, right, on the page, because I have to put all the letters next to each other. And so, anytime you see the word analog, whether it has a capital A or a lowercase a, it's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six characters. And so it's going to take up that amount of space, depending on, you know, how, I guess the font size could be giant, but uh, it's going to take up a certain amount of space. Now, what happens when we digitize something and we make it a digital, uh, put it in its digital form, is that we replace the characters with electronic on and off states, or in the case of storage, magnetic positive and negative states. And there are really only two states that electricity can be in. Uh, electricity, so if I have a light, right, it can, here, well, here, let me get up really quick and let me turn the switch on this light because I'm going to turn on the fan anyway. There we go. So <laughs> electricity can only have two states. 
and we're gonna uh, ignore dimmers. It can either be off, right? So there's no electricity going to the light bulbs, or it can be on. There is electricity going to the light bulbs. So I'm gonna turn this off and actually turn on the fan. There we go, because it's really warm in here. So in the digital world, we represent the off state of electricity with a zero. I'll put a line through it so that it's not an O. Or we represent the on state with a one. And these are called bits. Now in storage, it's typically, uh, like magnetic storage, it's typically uh, negative or positive Right, if you hold have two magnets and you put them next to each other, they attract each other, that's positive. And then if you turn one of them the other way around, they repel each other. <coughs> so that's the negative state. Um, on things like flash drives, it's just the zero or one is stored in the memory. These are called bits. A zero or one is a bit. And remember that with the analog form, I can create as many characters as I want. So if you look at a different language like uh, Japanese or Chinese, they have very complex characters and they have a lot of them. I think Mandarin has like 10,000 different characters or more. Uh, so <clears throat> Some people never learn all of them, or most people don't learn all of them. Uh, so it depends, right? It depends on how many shapes I can create. And I'm pretty sure that there's a pretty much an infinite amount of shapes I can create because I can, this could be, well, that's crap. Uh, this could be a certain character, right? And, uh, you know, I can, and if I have two lines, it's a different character. So I can create a, a lot of different analog forms. Now, with electronic states, we have on and off. So I have a zero and a one. So I can't really, there's no, I can't create more. So in order to represent data digitally, we can't just use the zeros or ones. Otherwise I could only, uh, you know, do two things. And uh, if I only do two things, if I only use the zeros and ones, then uh, you know I could say that the zero represents, oops, I gotta go back to drawing. The zero represents uh, blue, wrong drawing. And the one could represent red, or the zero could be the letter A, and the on state could be the letter C. So I could only represent two or whatever. Uh, I could only represent two things. So in order to get around that, we combine zeros and ones together to create what we call a byte. And a byte, it's uh, B-Y-T-E. A byte is a combination of zeros and ones. Whoops. A combination of zeros and ones. And a byte is equal to at least eight bits. I drew this wrong. Okay, so a byte is at least eight bits. Now, when we have eight bits, that means that I have eight spots. One two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I can fill those up with zeros and ones. I'll put a zero there instead, even though it's not right. Um, so <clears throat> now I can combine, right? Each one of these places can have a zero or a one in it. So that means it's uh, two times 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 two, which is two to the eighth, which is equal to 256 different combinations. So now if I use 8-bit bytes, I can represent 
let's go with the uh, letters, I can represent 256 different characters, which is perfectly fine for the English language. We have 26 letters, and then we have numbers, and we have punctuation, and um, some other, like an asterisk and, and some other characters, parentheses, I guess those are they're not punctuation, but there's some special characters. And 256 is perfectly fine to cover all of that. If we have a language like Chinese where there are 10,000 characters or more, then obviously using 8-bit bytes isn't going to cover it because I can only represent 256 different characters. And by the way, I could be colors also. Uh, which is another place where the 8-bit byte falls down because there are more than 256 different shades of color in the world. So um, typically what happens then is we have bytes that use more than 8 bits. So if I go to 16 bits or, or more commonly 24-bit bytes, uh, it, with 24-bit bytes I can represent 16,700,000 individual pieces of information. So characters, I can do 16,700,000 characters. And colors, I can do 16,700,000 individual shades of color. And that tends to be a lot and, and is enough, especially for uh, doing uh, pictures, for instance. Uh, a lot of pictures uh, use uh, 24 bits. Uh, so when you take a photograph or a video, a lot of times they're using 24 bits. Uh, and that's just so that we can represent all of the data that's in the frame, all of the different colors. Now, uh, you can go higher. There are 32-bit bytes and 64-bit bytes. Um, a lot of that is used for audio and video. So when we have sound and uh, images and colors, I should say, then, then we need more bits per byte. So, um, so what are the advantages of digital as opposed to analog? So let me undo stuff here and get back to a point where I have room to draw. And the, the undo keyboard shortcut doesn't actually work on this, so it's a little bit difficult. And, and it's each line is a bit of a pain. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, come on. There we go. Oops. The main advantage that analog has over the digital form is that the analog version of whatever it might be is usable to us as it is. So that means that if I have a book, all I got to do is open it and I can read it if I can read because I, I can use it. Now, if I had a book that had zeros and ones in it instead of the analog characters, A, B, C, D, then unless I could read bits and, or read bytes, uh, I can't use it. I have to transfer it or uh, convert it back into its analog form and able to be able to use it. Um, the same with audio and video. Uh, audio is saved as zeros and ones, and you can't listen to zeros and ones. Even if you could read what it said, it wouldn't make any sense because it's a sound, especially if it's music. So we have to convert it from its digital form into its analog form and then play it back through speakers uh, so that we can hear it. So it's usable to us, and I sh it shouldn't say use here, it should say to us. It's usable as it is. Other than that, uh, there's no advantage. The analog form wears out with time, so the more you use it, the faster it will stop working. So a book, the more it's used, you know, pages start to fall out, it starts to deteriorate, uh, maybe the corners get, you know, crinkly and they start uh, 
if it's really crappy and you, and you use stuff all the time, the, the lettering could start to come off. So it will degenerate over time and usage. Uh, our, our bodies are analog and the more we use them, so for instance, take a, a football player, professional football player, a lot of professional football players, they've played uh, you know, a contact sport since they were very young and they have used their bodies a lot. And by the time that they're retired, you know, 35, they're needing hip replacement surgeries and elbow surgeries, and they got, you know, back problems, and they, there's all kinds of things. And the reason is basically because they use their bodies uh, very intensively, uh, and it causes them to wear out. It causes our bodies to wear out faster. So like mine is wearing out, but it's at a slower rate <laughs> because I didn't play professional sports. Um, and so I didn't use the body. Uh, you know, constantly at very high levels. <clears throat> um, digital stuff does not wear out. So if you, uh, you look at a, a read a book that's in its digital form, hell, you could read it a million times and the pages aren't going to fall out and the letters aren't going to deteriorate. You could listen to a song or look at a picture over and over and over again, and it won't deteriorate with usage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, whereas, it, uh, like a, a record, which is an old analog form, the more you listen to it with a needle actually touching the, the vinyl, the worse it sounds. So if you listen to a song a million times on a record, or hell, even a hundred times on a record, it sounds worse than the first time you played it because it deteriorates with usage. Whereas a digital song, an MP3 file, you listen to it over and over again, you could listen to it a million times. It won't, it'll sound exactly the same, I should say, um, than it did the first time you, you listened to it. So that's an advantage that digital has over analog. <laughs> it doesn't wear out with usage. It doesn't wear out just being stored. So a lot of digital, a lot of analog media, if you have a, a, a book that's 400 years old and it's been stored and just sitting there, it's gonna be very fragile. So when, maybe when you turn the pages, they start to break apart. So you have to be, and, and that's even if it wasn't used, it just sat in a box. Whereas the digital form, if I put this flash drive, well, okay, so here's the, here's the tricky bit. <clears throat> the digital media doesn't wear out. It's the storage device that wears out. So if you have music on a CD, and you put the CD in its case and you put it in a shelf and it's not in the sun and it just sits there, the shelf life of a CD being able to hold the data uh, might be a hundred years. And after that, the storage media starts to degrade. Um, that's, that can be a problem with digital media, but the actual file itself doesn't just, if the, like if this, if this works, like let's say that I put a song on here and next week I know that this isn't gonna be degraded because it's not that old. Um, it will work. The digital media itself, if this USB drive was able to hold it, the storage capacity for hundred years, the media on it would work. The book or the music would work and it would sound exactly the same as it did the first time that I listened to it when it was brand new. Not that I'm gonna to live to be 100 years old, so I'd probably be dead before then, but somebody else could listen to it. <clears throat> the other big advantage that digital media has is that it doesn't take up storage space in the physical sense. And I talked a little bit about that when we talked about storage. So if I have digital books, and I have 300 of them on my phone or on my USB drive, that's how much physical space it takes up. It takes up as much space as the storage device. If I have a book and I have 300 of these, it takes up, if you know, 300 books take up 
less space than 500 books. And 500 books take up less space than 600 books. So the more I have of it, the more actual physical space I need to find in order to store it. And so you have to put things in a box and then the box goes in the garage or it goes in the attic or it goes in a closet or it goes under the bed, right? We have to find physical space to store things. And analog stuff, everything that's analog, and by the everything in this room is analog, um, except for the computer, um, but the fan, the pictures back there, the frames, the television, the mirror, all of the furniture in here. I have to find a place to store all of that. And it, what I use is called a house. So I have a house to store all of my stuff. Um, <clears throat> and even to store my digital, my storage devices, I have to have a place to put those. If you had a digital bed, by the way, um, you wouldn't be able to use it until it was put back into its analog form. Um, so we can't actually store physical things digitally because there's no way to convert it back and forth. It's not the matrix. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the difference. Be oh, the other, another big difference uh, and an advantage of digital is that uh, digital stuff is easy to search. So if you have a library full of books where each book and each page of the book has been scanned, you could just search for a particular phrase and you could search the contents of all of the books and get results, uh, you know, very, very quickly. Whereas in its analog form, in order for me to search even just one book in a library, first I have to find the book. So that takes time. Then once I have found the book, I have to open the book and then search the actual contents of the book to see whether what it is that I'm looking for is even in it. And so uh, that takes significantly more time. So there's a huge advantage to having information represented in its, or not represented, but in its digital form. Uh, and there are multiple advantages. Um, so that's really the difference between analog and digital. One other difference is that the, the, um, in analog, the output is proportional to the input. So what that basically means is that in order for me to make my voice louder, I have to, what's the input to make my voice? Uh, wind or air, not wind, air going over my vocal cords. And the more air that I force over my vocal cords, the louder I become. Conversely, if I have less air going over, I, become, I start talking very quietly and you can't understand me. So uh, the amount of loudness is proportional to the amount of air that I force with my lungs through uh, my vocal cords. And that's a proportion. Um, so that's why the input is proportional to the output. So how much air I force over my vocal cords dictates how loud my voice actually is. <clears throat> so, um, whereas with digital media, uh, it's not. So how does something become louder or less loud digitally? Well, we record what the volume is and we represent the volume using a byte not air. And then we apply that to that part of the sound. So there's a lot of information that's being stored that doesn't have to do with the actual music, uh, but it has to do with, hey, what kind of sound is it? Uh, what's the volume of that sound, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, it, digital stuff is very complex. And again, you cannot use digital media in its native form. It has to be translated back. So what happens when you have a Word document that's a file, you double click on it and you have to open it in Word. It's translating it from the zeros and ones into letters, characters, A, B, C, D, E, so that we can actually read it and use it. Okay, so having said that, um, let's talk about 
let me clear this. So let's talk about some of the things that are in the book. So this is module one. And module one is the impact of digital technology. And basically, it's talking about how computers have come to kind of take over everything that we do. And the first section here is to, you know, society's reliance on technology. And there's a history of uh, computers and how they started and uh, where we are now. And there's a couple of things that we, you should understand. First off, pretty much your phone, this is a computer, a smartphone is a computer. Your computer, laptops, uh, what are they called? Um, iPads, uh, tablets, tablet computers, desktop computers. Uh, those are all, whether they're called computers or not, computing devices. And what's been happening in the recent, well, I shouldn't say recent, it's recent for me because I'm so old. Uh, in the last 10 or 15 years is that we have got more and more uh, computers, small computers that are embedded in other devices. So for instance, um, <clears throat> a lot of refrigerators, well, a lot of refrigerators, if you buy a refrigerator that's very, very expensive, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things that, that's, that's happening nowadays more often is that there's a camera inside the refrigerator and you can, it's connected to the internet and you can use your phone to connect to the refrigerator and see what's in it by accessing the, the camera in it. Now, um, it's supposedly if you go to the grocery store and you go, oh crap, I don't know, do I have enough milk? Uh, I better look. And there's a camera in there and so you can see. Uh, I don't remember. <clears throat> uh, you can, uh, let's see, under, cars are, are a huge example, right? There's a computer that monitors the tire pressure. So the air in your tires. And if you have a low tire, bink, it shows up on the, on the dashboard. Um, let me do this really quick. Um, uh, what's the other thing in cars? Oh, uh, cruise control. So a lot of uh, cars have what they call adaptive cruise control, where it keeps a certain distance from the car in front of you. Um, and if they speed up, you speed up. If they slow down, you slow down. Uh, that uses a computer. Um, GPS navigation in your car also uses a computer. Uh, the engine is controlled with a computer. Uh, the climate control system, the air conditioning and the heating, uh, a lot of times is also controlled using an embedded little computer. And these are computers that aren't the general kinds of computers that we have. They're dedicated to a certain function. So a computer is kind of an all purpose thing. A phone is also an all purpose thing or multi-purpose, but these small ones perform a particular task. And um, so they can be very limited in scope. Um, the airbag system, the safety systems in cars, some of them will break uh, automatically if there's an object in front of you. Uh, my uh, car has a hard drive for music, so I can copy things from a USB drive to the hard drive that's in the car, and so, uh, or from my phone or from uh, even a CD. Uh, I can just copy the music and then I don't have to have the original source of the music. Uh, I can just listen to it in the car uh, because it's stored on the hard drive in the car. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, the other thing that I was talking about when we started talking about, you know, uh, having a small computer in a device at home, like a washer or a dryer, or even a toaster, uh, and having all of those things connected to the internet. That's called IoT, the Internet of Things. It's a kind of an important concept because that's really what's happening right now is more and more devices are going to have, you know, you're going to be able to have put toast in your toaster, 
well, toast. I guess you don't put toast in the toaster. What you do is you put um, bread in the toaster. And uh, you'll be driving home and you can get on your phone and your toaster is connected to the internet and you can say, start toasting because I'm two minutes away from home and I want toast when I get home. Um, I have a Nest thermostat, so uh, I can use my phone and go to the Nest app and I can see what the temperature is and I can adjust the thermostat, turn on the AC, turn on the heat, turn it down, turn it off, do whatever it is that I need to do. And I can do that whether I'm home or not. So uh, more and more things are going to have um, computers in them, built in them, uh, and more and more things are going to be controlled or be able to be controlled through the internet. Uh, security systems are one of those things where you have cameras and you can access the ring. You have a doorbell and it's got a camera in it, and as soon as somebody rings it, if you're not home, it, well, even if you're home, uh, your phone goes, hey, there's somebody at the door and it shows you the image, and you can see who's at the door and you can speak to them as if you were home. So, uh, you know, I just saw, uh, I was at Best Buy the other day and we were looking at the appliances and I saw a stove that cost, I don't know, $7,000. I was like, wow, look at this thing. And it said Wi-Fi enabled right on it. So, you know, you can adjust the temperature and start cooking your roast whenever you want. Um, I guess we don't have robots, so nobody can actually put the food in the oven to get it out and prepare it. But um, if you did it beforehand, uh, you can. Did I turn off the oven when you leave and go on vacation? Well, you can look it up. So <clears throat> IoT, the Internet of Things, is what's really, really um, exploding. And as the technology gets cheaper and more and more of us have high speed Internet service, well, uh, because everything, I don't even know how many devices I have that connect to the uh, internet uh, through my connection. Um, there's my phone, my wife, so there's three phones at least. There's three tablets, there's two, three laptops, there's a regular computer, there are my DVD players, there's two of those. Then both of th all three of the televisions, one, two, three, um, the Alexas, there are two of them. Um, what else do I have? Oh, my Nest. I had to change my Wi Fi password, and it was a big pain in the butt because I had to reconnect everything. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff. I, I, I easily have 20 devices at my house that, that, um, that connect to the internet and that need an, well, they don't, I guess, well, the Nest needs an internet connect. Well, it doesn't really need one to run, but it needs one if I want to access it. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff that the, the IOT, the internet of things is exploding. Um, I do not have a ring doorbell yet. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Explore the back impact of virtual reality. Uh, use robotics and virtual reality, utilize technology and uh, <clears throat> technology to assist user with disabilities, users with disabilities, um, technology and healthcare. So some of this stuff in education, uh, we know that if we didn't have the internet and computing devices that we couldn't be going to school right now because uh, we'd have to be on campus. And if we weren't able to be on campus, we couldn't, you couldn't take classes I couldn't teach. So I'd be out of a job and you'd be twiddling your thumbs looking for a job um, until we were able to actually go back to campus. So um, that has had a huge impact on education. Uh, we're all working from home. And even my daughter who's in high school, she's at home uh, taking her classes. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at the first chapter. Again, it's called The Impact of Digital Technology, and it is in uh, the computer concepts section of the book. And it is the first chapter. You don't have to read it. I want you to look at kind of the headings see what it is that they're, they're talking about a bit. Uh, you don't have to read it word for word. 
but uh, know some of the, the highlights of that chapter. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that the things that I talked about at the beginning, what is a computer? It's an input output device. What is processing? Um, what do we use computers for? And I'm sure that you can think of other things that we use computers for uh, more than I mentioned. Uh, all of those things are fair game. And I know that a lot of those will be on our first um, test. So uh, make sure that you, you know, watch the video. And by the way, there should be a, a closed captioning on all of the videos. So um, this is the first lecture. We'll see how this goes. By the way, um, uh, next week uh, we'll be doing uh, lectures on Word and there'll be four of those. They, they won't all be next week. I'll do two next week. And like I said uh, in a different video in my, uh, the video where I went over the syllabus and I might as well just do this right now. Um, <clears throat> in the traditional format, we have an hour and 20 minutes twice a week. So I would, we would meet, my class was always 5.30 to 6.50 and uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. So we have uh, two hours and 40 minutes of class time. And so I'm going to try to split that up into two lectures uh, online. <clears throat> some of them are, are, might go a little bit longer, but I doubt it. And some of them might be a little bit less, uh, which is probably more likely. So um, make sure that you do watch the videos uh, because a lot of the information that I talk about will be on our tests. When we do Word, for instance, I will talk about uh, how to do stuff and I will show you how to do everything that you need to do in order to complete the assignments. So uh, watching the, the videos, the lectures is important. You can't just, you can use the book as a reference probably for doing the assignments, but there are some things that are important. So uh, that I talk about and show you how to do that make it much easier than, than reading the book. So uh, try to follow along and remember that you can watch YouTube videos at a faster speed. It makes me sound funny, but uh, you can still kind of understand it and you can get through. And then if you have a, ah, this is important. This is important. You can slow down. And um, so there you go. So until I post the next video, and hopefully I'll only have to do that one once instead of twice, um, uh, have a good week. Uh, oh, don't forget about my office hours. Um, I'd like you all to check in at some point, and some of you are having some issues with some stuff. So uh, I have office hours today, uh, starting in about an hour, and I have office hours tomorrow, Wednesday, starting at noon. So um, try to check in. Okay, so having said that, we'll see you later.